Welcome, everyone. I want to officially start today. Welcome to How to Prevent a Mental Meltdown. These are stressful times for everyone in the world, and we're going to talk about some strategies that have been used for decades by researchers when it comes to stress reduction and it comes to building resiliency. And I don't want to make light of anyone's trauma or the tragedies that they are going through today. We hope to strengthen everyone that is has chosen to be on this call. I have to just start with one little uh, anecdote from my own family about hard times. My mother was a young girl during the Great Depression, and she said that one winter all they had to eat were pears that they had canned themselves and milk that a neighboring farmer gave them. And I think about this when I have hardships or when I have troubles, and I think that if they can live through that winter we can use our genius, our hustle, our spirit, our tenacity, and we can live through this coronavirus. Today, let me get my slides here. We're going to, today we're going to talk about two levels of the uh, coronavirus quarantine. I guess there's two types you might say. One is the quarantine and economic economic slowdown that everyone is suffering through. And this means that we don't have a normal life. We don't have a social life. We can't go out and eat. Uh, we have to homeschool. We're closed in our quarters. You know, the walls are falling in on us. I like to bang my head against the wall. I've heard this from everyone. And I have a rebellious friend who just gets fed up with it and gets in her car and drives around the block just to show how strong she is. But then there's the second time of uh, kind of job uh, of stress today, and that is the job loss. Or in other words, people may be on this call that have lost their jobs and have no income and are wondering how to pay the rent. As I said, I don't want to make light of your trauma and the tragedy that's happening to you, but I want to give you things that will strengthen you today. And why I'm telling you this is that what I'm bringing you and what I'm telling you work in many levels of stress. But if you have lost your job and have no income, the things that we're going to talk about today, you have to implement 10 times the intensity that we are perhaps suggesting here. And we want you to know that our thoughts and prayers are with you, that you'll be able to stabilize yourself in this environment. Now, it's difficult to reflect on this beautiful time of year, knowing that it's spring, and it's usually a wonderful time when we're out doing yard work and we're uh, you know, starting to have barbecues and we're getting back out to run and to, and to jog around the neighborhood. And it's a little difficult to think that it's spring is in full bloom and yet we're quarantined and we can't really enjoy it. And yet, what do we know? I want you to reflect on what we do know. My friend Richard Wildman sent me this, and I thought I would share it with you today because it's a very powerful statement that gives you hope. He says in his statement that focusing on the future allows us to move forward from the now that is a struggle. And a positive outlook reassures, reassures us and others that this is a time of uncertainty, but we can conquer. No matter what, people are here for you and you are here for them, even if it is at a distance. Hard work and dedication to your craft will always overcome fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And what this means in my mind is that uh, we all have skills, we all have um, different talents, and if you can work on those during this time, work on your craft, learn something new to help your job, uh, then you will be able to overcome some of this uncertainty and doubt and be filled with new ways to go forward. And if it was not for you, many would not see or hear, would not, I'm sorry, would not know or see the path forward. And what this means is that um, you need to help other people and other people will help you. So stay focused on what we do know, because the best is yet to come, because we are, and I love this word, we are overcomers. So let's get wound up and get going. These are 10 things that I'm going to go through, 10 tips that can make a difference in your life. So we can take a break from the news, take time for exercise, dust off your hobby, eat healthy, try to get plenty of sleep, build relationships with your family, connect with your extended family, keep up with associates on social media, 
Talk to someone you trust about how you feel and serve someone else. Now, let's just kind of dig into these a little deeper. First tip, take a break from the news. I cannot believe I said that because I am a news junkie. But the news in today's world can absolutely put your hair on fire. So you might want to take a break from that uh, for just a little while. Tip two is get some exercise. Now, I have to tell you that I don't exercise to look like the really, really thin models because it's not working. But I exercise because it gives me more clarity of mind and it gives me more energy. And it helps to get rid of the negative emotions and the hormones that get in our body. You also have to stretch when you've been sitting all day working and get the blood flowing and get in your body. Now, these are just some examples here. As you can see, the young lady on the left is doing a down dog. She's doing yoga and she has her little pooch right there with her. Now, I got to tell you, if you have kids, they're going to be right there where that pooch is and they make it a little different to do, difficult to do yoga. And you see the man out jogging down the street. By the way, when you're out jogging uh, in today's world, there's not a lot out there with you except maybe the pollen. So if you have allergies, you uh, will resist that a little bit. And the lady on the right there, I'm not sure how much meditating she's getting done if she's looking at work on her computer, but she may be doing a yoga exercise with someone. Uh, there are yoga exercises and all kinds of exercises that you can get on YouTube and on your favorite channel, uh, your um, cable channel. And maybe you have a Peloton. What I'm just saying is exercise will help you even in the down times. It will help you to en enliven yourself and to naturally feel uplifted. So don't let that routine down. Now the tip number three is to dust off your hobby. There are tons of hobbies that people have. Some like uh, photography, some like needlework, some like woodworking, some like gardening, others like ham radios. And I believe some people actually think cleaning is a hobby. I know people who just are absolutely clean freaks. Now, my hobby happens to be music. And I don't play the guitar, but I do play the piano. And it relaxes me to sit and play. I'm really rusty from the last few years, but it, it soothes me to go in and uh, use my fingers and kind of let my stress go out my fingers into the keyboard. And I'd like you to have something like this that Take your mind off of the difficulties that we're having. Some people like to cook. And are, are you a chef in hiding? And actually, this time, I'm learning how to cook again because we can't run out at night to uh, pick something up. So I'm uh, reinventing my uh, cooking and baking habits. And this tip leads us into tip number four, which is to eat healthy. And... As we look at this, the steak and the salmon look really delicious, don't they? And if we do the right thing, our vegetables might even be appealing. And I put the picture of the juice up there because uh, juicing and sometimes I like to drink my vegetables. <laughs> so you see the carrot juice there with the turmeric and uh, the other one there, beet, you know, beets are really good for your body. They clean your body out. And I don't know if that's a purple cabbage in the top of that, but that would be a very interesting drink. Then it looks like there's a kale drink and spinach drink on the other side there. So try some new things because if you don't try these new things, you're tempted like me. See that croissant and that uh, chocolate piece in the middle? That's where my default would be because I'm all with the conservationist, you know, save the planet. It's the only planet with chocolate. And every time I think about eating healthy, a uh, chocolate bar snickers at me. So you have to make a, a good choice to eat the good food rather than just default. And, and I, I say this seriously because in times of stress, often we default, default to foods that aren't really good for us. So make conscious choices about the food that you're eating and, and plan ahead on it. Now, tip number five involves sleep. This picture, I, I saw that man laying there and I go, that's just like me. That's the way I feel. About two o'clock in the morning, my eyes are wide open. And uh, that's not so healthy for you. And, the, and there's a couple things about nighttime that um, I want to talk about. But first, I hope you are getting in bed and not just sleeping on the couch like this. Or maybe this is the fellow that's been awake all night and he's finally getting to sleep. However, if you want to sleep like a baby, I've got a few tips for you. 
And I must say, I don't think you'll ever sleep like a baby. <laughs> Not that good. But before you calm down at night while you're in that kind of cool down period of the day, I think a few stretches, calisthenics, things like that, help to work out the stress that you feel. Not a full workout before bed, but a few stretches would work. And we can take a clue from Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory and drink some chamomile tea. We can read something inspirational. What's your favorite sitcom if it calms you down? Don't watch the news, remember. You can listen to good music. You can calm your mind with um, with the different types of things. Think of the things that you really like that make you feel good. And do one of those as the night comes. So... <clears throat> As we look here, one of the things that bothered me, I don't know what it is about night, but you have the dark coming in and you're trying to go to sleep. And all of a sudden, my mind is filled with all the shouldas, the couldas, the why did I do that, the stupid things that I've done. And we have to somehow get rid of those. And one of the, um, one of the great techniques that I have found is to make a victory film in your mind. A victory film is just clips of you when you really performed well, when you did an excellent job, and when people praised you. And then instead of thinking about all the could have, would have, should have, then you think about the things that went well. One of the tips is that you have to close out your day. And this comes from the time management classes that I teach. And what it means is that every day you should be doing a task list. And uh, knowing what you're going to be doing throughout the day. So when it comes time at night, then you check the things off that you did and you move the things forward to the next day. And what this does is make it so you're not worrying all the time. It makes it so you're not worrying about, oh, I have to, don't forget to do this tomorrow. Oh, I've got to do this first thing. I have to have that in by 12. I have to have that in by five. You already know that. And when you know that, you'll be able to calm down and you'll have a better chance of sleeping like a baby. Now, the tip number six is to build relationships with your family. And I know this looks like the per perfect pictures. These are perfect pictures of perfect kids. And I've raised three myself and I know that every moment isn't like this, especially bedtime. But if you work hard and if you put in some effort, you can build relationships with your family during this time. And, of course, uh, who's going to win here? They do look like they're having a good time. Tip number seven is to connect with your extended family. And i got to promise you, if you call your grandma or grandpa, they're going to look just like those people on the right. They're going to be so happy that you called. Tip number eight is to keep connections with your associates alive. You could even take pictures of your food, but, but keep up that social chatter between you. Tip number nine is to talk to someone you trust about how you feel. Uh, because so often we bottle up all of these emotions and we put on this brave face and, and we act like nothing's wrong, but there's a lot wrong inside. And if you're not talking about it, uh, then it's, it's going, and if you're suppressing it, it's going to come out at some time. So talk to someone you trust. And I love this quote by author George Eliot. She said, what do we live for if not to make life less difficult for each other? Think about that. We can help each other through this crisis. Of course, I don't think that woman really likes what the gentleman is telling her, or maybe she's just very stressed out. But I had to chuckle and I thought, no, I don't think she likes what that uh, coach is telling her to do. At any rate, share. Share your feelings with other people. And because telling a trusted friend is something that gives you release of stress. Now, the tip number 10 is to give service or accept service. Now, we're really uh, thankful for the uh, responders that we have, the first responders and the nurses and the doctors on the front line. But in our little neighborhood, there's been people that have been making masks for these people and uh, sewing them at home and giving them to them out of the cloth that they have. And there's others that are uh, putting out that they have extra cleaning supplies if people need them. And others are saying, you know, if you're in um, one of the high risk, um, high risk age groups, then we'll come and get your, we'll bring your groceries or we'll, we'll go pick up something for you. 
So reach out and give service, and it always makes you feel better. It enlivens your spirit. So the release of stress in the beginning of resilience means we don't complain and we don't place blame. We wind ourselves up and get going on solutions so today we're going to go uh, through four stress reduction and resilience principles. There are many, but I've kind of refined them into these four that I'd like to go over today. Uh, the first one is that we have to accept things that we can't change. The second is to learn to tolerate uncertainty in our lives. And the third one is to focus on controlling those things that you can control. And the fifth one, or sorry, the fourth one is, is to practice gratitude. So accept facts that you cannot change. This is principle one. Now, if you've done any work in stress or resiliency, you know that these are predictable stages of grief. And this is the Swiss American psychiatrist, the Elizabeth Kubler Ross's model. And what she's saying in here, as she studied people who were going through grief, she said that everyone goes through these levels. Now, what's interesting are these stages, you might say. Now, what's interesting about it is uh, you can go through them quickly. You can stay in them 10 minutes, or you can stay in them 10 years. And some of it depends on your personality. For instance, I think someone who has a dominant personality may stay in anger longer than some of the other people. And those who have a, a propensity to depression, um, if they have a, a conscientious personality, is probably going to stay in depression longer. But the point is, is that you go through these stages. And so denial is saying, oh, this is not happening to us. Anger. I am so mad this happened. Bargaining is, well, if we'd have done or we should have, why did we, you know, and you're going through all that, trying to find meaning or make sense out of what's happening or, or how you could have avoided it. And then you go through depression. It's like deep, dark depression um, and where, where you're not able to do anything. So when you get into these stages, what I'm telling you is that nothing positive happens until you get down to acceptance, acceptance of the situation because then you can start generating positive things in your mind. This book changed my life. It was worth every penny I paid for it when I read the very first sentence in the beginning of the book. The very first sentence said, life is difficult. Once you accept that, it no longer matters. And so what we're saying about this coronavirus is it's a tragedy. It's a trauma for everyone. Once we accept that, it just means that we move forward doing what we can. And so as we move from acceptance of what's happening to the uncertainty of the world, remember that uncertainty brings fear, worry, negative emotions. But it also brings, if we can look on the other side of the coin, it also brings growth, resiliency, innovation. And remember that there is nothing in life that is absolutely certain. I have to bring up one other quote that I like. Hans Selye, who was one of the first researchers in stress, and he's the one that gave us the fight or flight uh, model. He said that zero stress equals death. So I'm glad I have a little bit of stress in my life because I'm really actually glad I'm here in this world. Now, there's a little a bit of an emotional intelligence component to what we're talking about here. Because when you're in high emotion, which we all are, we're, we're angry, we're fearful, uh, we're going to cut out the excitement and the love because you can go either way there. But we're angry, we're fearful, we're disgusted, we're frustrated, we're not sure where to go. And do you see the amygdala there? That's the one that's taking over because that's the source of our emotions. But the interesting thing is it disables our higher cortex. Our higher cortex is our thinking, our logic our solutions, our problem, you know, finding, uh, finding solutions to problems, that's the higher cortex. So what we're saying here is don't let the emotions just take over your life, but start thinking using your logic and flip to that higher cortex. We're going to have some emotions for sure, but the, but the way to get out of them is to flip over and start to problem solve. Because uncertainty brings these reactions. Uh, we're seeking excessive reassurance from others. And, and uh, there's a, a little bit here that we don't want to become total victims of our emotions, but we want to be strong individuals. And so seeking excessive reassurance from others can make you more on the victim side as opposed to the strong individual, or you might say the mentally tough person. We begin micromanaging people. 
procrastinating, checking things over and over, rechecking them. Um, it's, it's kind of a form of procrastinating as well, isn't it? So look at those and say, what am I doing that I could, that I could realize that this is the uncertainty about it and I can uh, rework what I am doing within these areas here. And one of the things that has always been amazing to me is that when we're um, in this uncertainty, we resort to warrant, to worrying. And I love the quote by Mark Twain. He said, many horrible things have happened in my lifetime, a few of which actually happened. And so what I'd like to bring out to you today is that we need to live in today in the present. We can't go back. We can't have that guilt and worry about the past or the coulda, shoulda, woulda. And if we look at the future, just worrying about what's coming or what's not coming or what might happen, then we're kind of spinning our wheels. And uh, one person told me that you're crossing the bridge twice because you have to cross it in today. And so may I tell you that planning is the work of worrying. You sit down and you plan out what you're going to do and how you're going to get around uh, this trauma that we're having. So this brings us to what you can control and what you cannot control. As you can see here in this quadrant, you can uh, control something and take action, which is a producer. It's a powerful person. When you look at something and say, I can do something about this. Then you have it where you could take control, but you take no action. And what I like about, or the way I explain this is that uh, I can drive into my driveway and look to the left and, and there's a flower bed there, a very weedy flower bed. And I can just say, well, I wish my husband would pull those weeds. Oh, I sure wish we had enough money to hire a gardener. Whoa, why did God make weeds? See, I'm whining because I could get out and pull the weeds myself. And that whining makes unhappy people. Then you come down to action and no control. This means that people have no control, but they keep taking useless action. We have no control over this coronavirus. We have no control over taxes, God, and the weather. But when we keep trying to take action, we get burned out and angry, and we become neurotic people. But the next quadrant there, where you have no control and you take no action, is a powerful quadrant, because these are where smart people are, and they're happy people. And because they understand that this, this is something that's happened to us, we have no control, and I am going to move on, or I am going to take action. Now, in the last few minutes we spend together, I want to talk a little bit about gratitude. Uh, Cicero told us that gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. And I love that phrase. And we have a decision to make whether we see the world as half empty, as the glass half empty or the glass half full. And I know that a lot of people have half empty glasses right now, and we're all pulling for you that soon your glass will start to become half full and you can move forward. Eric Coffer tells us that the hardest arithmetic to master is that which enables us to count our blessings. And Charles Dickens said, Reflect on your present blessings, of which every man has many, and not on your past misfortunes, of which all men have some. So think about what you can be grateful for today. Now, the GLAD game is another way for reframing the issue. And as we come to the end of our 30 minutes here, if you have comments or questions, uh, especially if something has hit you in this uh, webinar that you think you could use, would you share that in the chat with other people? And when I'm done in two or three minutes here, we'll uh, read the chat. So if something is, has been an aha moment for you or strengthened you, please put that in the chat. The GLAD game is an interesting little uh, phenomenon, you might say. And as I say, it's another name for reframing the issues. Because in 1913, a woman by the name of Eleanor Porter wrote a novel about Pollyanna. And Pollyanna was a little girl who saw everything as good. She saw the benefit in what was happening or how she could get around it or how could she move or how could she reframe the issue. And she called it her glad game, what she was glad about in that situation that she was in. Now in the 1960s, this was made into a movie called Pollyanna. And uh, I've watched this with my kids 
later on, not in the 60s, but later on, uh, I had my kids watch this because it's a powerful, uh, powerful uh, message that it gives. Uh, and so what we can do in this time is kind of look forward and say, how can I reframe what's happening to me? How can I be stronger with what's happening to me? And as you do that, I believe that you will come to solutions that your intuition and, and your determination will help you get through this situation. And so just to help you even a little more here, well, first of all, let's reflect on what we know. I, I'd still like this Richard Wildman quote. We have to focus on the future to move out of the now. And the positive outlook reassures us. Okay, there's uncertainty here. But the glad game, the reframing, I'm going to find things that can make me better. And no matter what, people are here for you. And you are there for them. So it's a two-way street. And hard work and dedication to improving yourself will help you overcome fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And remember that you reach out and you serve other people. So we stay focused on what we know. Because the best is yet to come. Because we become overcomers. We become strong people. We become people who are resilient to what's happening around us. We don't just stop. We don't just stop and let the circumstances act on us. We act on the circumstances. And to help you do that even more, I've written a book called Wake Up the Winter Inside. And it's my gift to you today. It's a complimentary digital copy. You can go to carlabrando.com forward slash products. And you can download this digital copy for absolutely nothing. And it gives you 13 mental aerobics that will help you break down your personal barriers to success. But it's also 13 mental aerobics that will help you handle the stress that we're feeling right now. So with that, I'd just like to uh, see if there are people in the chat that have said something uh, that would uh, strengthen us all and help us understand what maybe was an aha moment for you in this presentation. So if you'd want to uh, put that in the chat, uh, then we'll read them. We'll wait just a second or two here for people. I guess everyone's just kind of thinking to themselves, and uh, I hope you're taking down a few notes. I will send out a replay to you on this so that you can watch it again or you can share it with people in your life. Uh, and I just want to wish you well, and I thank you for attending. Have a great day.